Good morning. Welcome to the kickoff event for Gives to the Wolves Day here at the International Wolf Center. We want to welcome you to the exhibit pack. This morning's focus is going to be on the current ambassador, and we uh, want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the work that's done here at the center and, and certainly what is our focus as far as the support that we're receiving here on the Give to the Wolves Day. So at this moment, you're looking at the exhibit pack. It is a rainy day in Northern Minnesota, unusual for us in November. Uh, it, temperatures were 37 degrees overnight and um, that is not exactly conducive for Arctic wolves here. But I wanna share with you again, the uh, exhibit pack is now consisting of two wolves. This is Grayson, he and his brother Axel are Arctic subspecies. They were born in 2016 and all of our wolves are born in a human centered environment and we adopt them at a age. And uh, you are hearing some ravens in the background. Uh, those ravens are feeding on leftover deer legs from last night. So our pack here is fed roadkill deer and beaver. And so you're gonna see a lot of interactions between the scavengers and the wolves. So um, I will switch then to our other ambassadors. In uh, the East Side Retirement, we have Grizzer, 16 and a half years old. He is the oldest wolf we've ever maintained here at the center. We have been managing wolves here since 1989. And I'm uh, tonight's session at 4.30, I'm going to share a little bit of a kind of a memory of all of our wolves that are have, have gone on um, but are not forgotten. Um, in our history of, so I wanted to focus this morning on the current ambassadors. And then this evening, I'll talk a little bit about the ambassadors that have passed. And in the background here is Denali. Denali is a recent retiree, meaning that uh, he just came into retirement in October 16th. He is a Northwestern subspecies. So quite a bit larger, the wolf that's representative of the the uh, Yellowstone region. He is 12 and a half. He came to us from the Wildlife Science Center in, uh, at the time it was Forest Lake uh, in 2008. Uh, he and his brother Aiden were exhibit pack members and he is now just coming into what we call the pack holding area. So the retirees actually have three areas to roam. So as I look at this give to the max day, probably the biggest uh, kind of component that we appreciate from all of our supporters is the concern and care for our ambassadors. And that means whether it be facilities, making sure that they have comfortable, safe, protected out of the weather areas, or whether they are in a circumstance in the exhibit pack where they need um, rocks for erosion control, rocks for climbing, rocks for just overall perching opportunities, uh, whether it be helping the staff collect roadkill, uh, certainly all of the things that we know are important for managing our exhibit pack. So I wanted to, again, share with you, um, we've had some great news on the Give to the Wolves Day already. Donations started about a week ago. And so right now the Give to the Wolves campaign has started out pretty strong. We had a great uh, matching grant from the Annenberg Foundation. And if you're not familiar with the Annenberg Foundation, uh, we are recent recipients of their donation and uh, also of their, uh, certainly their support in the explorer.org cameras. And so what you're seeing here is the North camera. Basically there are two cameras that they place uh, on our exhibit and allows people to see the uh, two sides of the exhibit pack that are not normally on view on our webcams. And so basically uh, the Annenberg Foundation who supports the explore.org cameras uh, did a $25,000 match and our board of directors uh, did a wonderful uh, matching donation as well to help us partially reach our goal. But uh, overnight uh, we did get word from the governor that we are no longer uh, allowed to be open to the public. So our main source of revenue has definitely uh, been impacted by that. And so we have increased our campaign goal to $130,000 with the hopes of recovering some of that revenue that we'll be losing in the next four weeks by not having people on site. So a lot of people ask, well, if you don't have people on site, how do the wolves do? Well, there's no doubt wolf care staff are gonna to have to work pretty diligently, uh, again, to maintain the social relationship. And we've been doing it since 
Well, we've been doing it since 1989, uh, but the reality is uh, wolf care staff is a, a 365 day a year job. We are constantly uh, attending to the needs of the wolves, whether it be through staff on site or whether it be through webcams or whether it be through surveillance cameras. But uh, basically the needs of the wolves are always uh, first and foremost our priority here in wolf care, as well as obviously the wolves supporting the educational component of our uh, organization. So like I said, we're here not to take a lot of your time, but to wake you up this morning with a good howl. And so we are hearing Grayson, who's just doing some little mournful howls. We are still probably dealing with a little bit of separation anxiety from him. It was a week ago today that we um, did um, have to euthanize our eight-year-old pack member Bolts who had been um, suffering for several months with an unknown degenerative neurological condition. And uh, we are we're still waiting some test results. Actually, last night I compiled a series of his videos looking at his progressive state. Um, the neurologists want to take one more kind of uh, look at him physically uh, through the video and be able to try to identify what might be, uh, you know, what, what, what might be uh, a cause to his condition. Unfortunately, uh, at this point, nothing in the neurological information is yielding any kind of uh, a strong indication, but we're still waiting for, for more tests. So, so what I wanted to do, like I said, is um, give you a morning howl and um, let you experience what we experience every morning, which is wolves kind of up and moving around. Denali's still not quite settling into retirement as well. So he's a little bit more anxious. Grizzer here on the right, waiting for breakfast. Uh, Grizzer knows the wolf care staff are here. Um, he gets his breakfast every morning, three pounds of meat, uh, another uh, big expense for us here at the Wolf Center is we, uh, with the retirees, because their nutritional needs are a little bit different, uh, we do feed them daily a, a large, uh, the, like I said, three to four pounds of meat, whereas the exhibit pack um, gets to feed on a carcass, and that is a deer carcass or a beaver carcass or something like that, and they may cache it, they, they may gorge, they may eat up to 20% of their body weight and uh, be able to consume that carcass for uh, two or three days, what isn't lost to the scavengers, that is. And so certainly with only two wolves in the exhibit pack, uh, we're having to do a little bit more, um, to, you know, um, butchering up the carcasses, making smaller quantities and making them available to them. So right now, Krista Harrington, the interpretive center director is at the window, that's called the enrichment window. And that's a big component for our visitors um, is when the wolves who are tend to be a little bit more nocturnal during the summertime, are, are up in the woods, uh, the center will do enrichments uh, three or four times a day to try to, again, stimulate the wolves um, mentally, uh, physically, uh, you know, get them up and moving around so we can always have multiple checks a day on wolves. We certainly don't want someone sleeping all day long and then nobody gets an eye on them, you know, for 10 hours or whatever. Um, and obviously visitors uh, come to the International Wolf Center to see the wolves and be able to uh, have that experience. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Krista if she is willing to do a howl and see if we can stimulate uh, the wolves to communicate while I'm doing that. And uh, hopefully um, we can't always guarantee that the wolves will howl because they're not trained. Um, they're wolves, uh, you know, and uh, certainly they have their own independent nature, but uh, we will uh, try to do that so you can get a little bit of closer view. We're not usually getting the retirees to howl in response yet. That's typically something reserved uh, for the exhibit pack. So there's the howl and Krista's stimulated them. Looks like they went up in the woods. There's Grayson. So what you're hearing a little bit differently is that bark howl. And a bark howl is because, uh, you know, we don't, um, we're very busy people. So Krista and I are not sitting around howling all day long here. So they're not as familiar with Krista's voice. And so that made Grayson stimulate to a bark howl, which is more of a, a I'm gonna give a threat display. And so uh, Grayson has taken the lead in this exhibit pack um, uh, being uh, cautious about things that he's unfamiliar with. Um, so 
If you joined in earlier, you heard more of a kind of a mournful good morning, kind of a little bit more social hall. Clearly, you can hear the difference between the threat display um, going on here. And uh, we will calm Grayson down. Uh, we basically start wolf care staff, uh, wolf care here uh, uh, shortly after this broadcast ends and reassure him that his world is okay. And what he heard was not some, you know, um, invading wolf, but that was just one of us. So, um, like I said, it, it is something uh, we hear Grayson bark call quite a bit. And uh, that bark call is oftentimes stimulated by what if you're kind of around the exhibit. So I want to share with you uh, another point here is, like I said, the, the Annenberg Foundation supports the explore.org cameras, which are here and on explore.org. You can hear the howling as well. I'm going to turn that down just a little bit. And uh, we definitely want to, um, uh, we have uh, camera operators. Here. And that is um, uh, Ann Raspberry and Joanne Wessel, who are our camera operators that um, help operate the camera. Okay, I'm going to tell Krista to maybe come out and let um, Grayson know that he is not being invaded um um so he's getting a little bit a little bit excited there he doesn't recognize krista's voice so. and uh chris is going to go out and um greet him so to let him know that he is okay um again wolves are used to howling as a form of communication and certainly something that we want to make sure um you know that uh, uh when we do hear a little bit of territorial threat display that we check it out we make sure that it is you know you know not something that's kind of invading his world contractors on roofs um got them started last week and i'm gonna just switch cameras because that's getting a little loud there and so chris is going to come out of this gate and it's kind of reassuring. So he's up on top of the den. One of the things too, you'll also notice with howling, they like to get to high vantage points. So Krista is going to come out and reassure him that it's okay. It was just her. Um, and again, Grayson's going to come down and greet and um, calm that anxiety. Um, his tail, and actually that's the uh, exploit on our cameras on a time delay. So that's why you hear that extra howling there. But um, you'll see his tail came down. He came down in a T2 tail, which is kind of a, a serious tail. We call it the T2 is typically the straight out uh, predatory tail. And so that's all it took for him just to be reassured that it was not a big deal. And so like I say, we have wild wolves that are around here. We have, um, uh, you know, sometimes people howling in the parking lot. Um, certainly visitors like to howl. Uh, dogs can set them off. Sirens can set them off, uh, you know, ambulance, fire um, will also um, create howls. So, so that's an important part of the wolf care staff is to read behaviors, read body language, calm things down, and certainly uh, make sure that everybody's doing okay. So in retirement, um, did not get a response from those guys. Typically in retirement, well, Grizzers kind of um, doesn't hear very well anymore. He kind of knows what's going on. He's interested. You might notice here, he's using his nose. His strongest scent right now is his nose. His vision is very, very impacted by cataracts. He doesn't hear very well, uh, but he can stir a smell and he is very interested. And he's gonna go to the John and Donna Ver window. And that's a donation uh, plaque that we have or sign that we have there that is a favorite place for wolves to come and visit. And, um, Denali and Grizzard are getting along famously, sharing the same window so they can look out in the wolf yard and wonder what was all the ruckus about. Um, and like I said, that's the place where they watch for the wolf care staff to come in. So thanks for uh, joining us for this morning howling session. We had a little bit of different types of howl, the mournful good morning social howl, uh, the predatory howl, bark howl. And uh, we'll just kind of end here with a view of the exhibit pack and Axel and Grayson just kind of hanging out, uh, checking out the treats that uh, Krista gave for enrichment. So just as a reminder, uh, Wolf uh, gives you the uh, Wolves Day we'll have at our website at wolf.org. It's gonna have a running total. You can kind of see how we're doing. We're gonna do another webinar tonight at 4.30. And I hope to put together again, um, a webinar showing 
the legacy of the wolves that have gone before these current ambassadors. So I wanted to start of the morning with the current ambassadors and I wanna end the day as we hopefully look into the sunset, although it's raining right now, I'm not sure that we'll get a sunset, but I wanna share with you the wolves that have passed on and their legacy and, and the importance of their contribution to our success as the International Wolf Center since uh, 1985 is when we were first founded. So another point, if you're not familiar, with our site, you can go to the International Wolf Center's website at wolf.org, go to a link called Meet Our Wolves, and each wolf um, has its own kind of, uh, uh, or each pack has its own kind of details and uh, logs that we write about uh, information that's happened. And Bolts, who just recently passed on, um, had his own set of logs to give you an idea of update of his circumstance and what's going to happen. Uh, later on this week, uh, Bolts will be making the transition um, from uh, what he was known in the retired pack. Um, he'll be transitioning uh, to the gone but not forgotten pack. So Bolts is currently um, still in the retired pack as we get everything kind of transitioned with his medical records. He'll be joining the gone but not forgotten who will be the feature for the 430 webinar. So thanks again. and. Uh, if uh, you have questions, I didn't, um, a lot, I didn't um, mention that here, but we're always willing to answer questions for people. Um, if you have information about uh, each individual wolf that you're interested, more than happy to answer those questions. So just feel free to reach out to us. I'm at curator at wolf.org if you wanna reach out to me directly or just go to our website and we have a lot of information available. So again, thanks for your support to give to the Wolves Day here on 2020. Good afternoon. This is Lori Schmidt, the Wolf Curator for the International Wolf Center, and I'd like to welcome you to the Sunset webinar where on our Give to the Wolves Day, where we wanted to take time out to thank everyone for their support. We have met our goal, and you know, it doesn't mean that we um, certainly um, uh, wouldn't still accept uh, donations if there are people who are uh, have not had a chance to support our objective and our mission. Uh, uh, we are still uh, going strong until midnight tonight. So uh, donations will be accepted on our website at wolf.org. So what I thought I would do here tonight, I've got all four cameras on and I did have a, cue, a question came in about um, being able to see the pack holding area, which is this enclosure right here on the website. I apologize. I didn't know that it wasn't streaming on the website. Um, it should be now. It was uh, stalled. Uh, so I had to uh, reload it um, back to our website. So hopefully it's working by all means. If you see something that's um, should be working, that's not working, always ask. Um, there are some times when we are doing maintenance or we may have a wolf issue that prompts us to turn off a camera. But right now I am broadcasting all four cameras on the website. And if you go to the uh, donation for the get, we'll give to the wolves a day, you'll see uh, how expensive that is. That's about $100 a month streaming to get those four cameras uh, to our website. But it's an important part of our communication to our members and to uh, supporters uh, across the globe uh, to be able to see our wolves uh, during various times of the day when they're active or resting and certainly um, be able to have a connection with people when circumstances don't allow people to come or governor's orders don't allow us to be open, uh, which is uh, the current situation. So here we are, exhibit pack. This normally would have been a beautiful sunset, which is why I called it the sunset uh, webinar. But at this point, we're pretty cloudy. We're pretty dreary. It's really nice April weather, uh, not so much uh, typical November weather, but we'll start uh, cooling off here tonight. Uh, the biggest concern I have tonight is that uh, we have areas where uh, we might have our older wolves a little bit vulnerable because of freezing temperatures and wet grounds uh, freezing. So one of the uh, things that I um, spent a lot of time in the last probably two or three years working on is trying to make sure that these older wolves have areas that are covered and protected from the elements, mainly while they're walking through gates. I don't mind so much once they're back in the back habitat, 
when they've got a little bit of snow, but where it's really heavily traveled and through gates, we want to try to keep that as dry as possible. And so that's uh, one of the things that the Working for Wolves crew have done and have really uh, created a safer environment for our older wolves. So I, what I wanted to do tonight, well, again, was to kind of share, as I said this morning, if you're on for the howl with the wolf uh, sunrise, I wanted to spend a little bit more time with the uh, wolves. Uh, we, we categorize them as gone, but not forgotten uh, pack members. So what I did was I produced a little video, again, thanking people for their support uh, for this Give to the Wolves 2020. And I wanted to share with you um, what I consider to be um, some of the most memorable moments and some of the most biggest learning events or I consider legacies about our Ambassador Wolves. And again, I just want to reiterate that our Ambassador Wolves are here to teach the world about wolves and there's nothing more rewarding than to watch kids face-to-face uh, -face with our wolves at the window. The other rewarding thing is to watch our pups face-to-face uh, -face with their adult wolves as they are the future of our pack and COVID this year prevented us from getting pups from the Wildlife Science Center. Uh, we hope to go forward with that arrangement next year with them. We know it was a real hardship for those folks um, um, you know, to not uh, have us take the pups and, and to be an added expense for their facility. Um, but uh, we, again, um, have a great working relationship with the Wildlife Science Center and hope to continue um, into 2021 with pups. We started here in 1989 and we've had a lot of lessons, a lot of things learned in 89. And actually the first lesson was that we dealt with the coronavirus in 1989 not the COVID-19 human novel virus, but the coronavirus that is uh, impacts canids. And this was Raisa who was, was gravely ill with coronavirus as a 16 day old pup, required tube feeding, was, uh, was uh, lost all her hair, uh, took us a long time to get her back into a, a good healthy condition. So we've had a lot of experience over the years with medical issues, with health issues, um, every uh, wolf that has passed on um, has a legacy in our hearts and a legacy in our minds. And the 1989 litter, which was Raisa, Basha, Balazar, and Jedediah, the first thing we realized was that very small enclosures were kind of a challenge for them. We were seasonal at that time, meaning in 1989, 1990, 91, 92, uh, we closed in the wintertime. Our building wasn't insulated. Um, our building, um, you know, we, we brought the wolves back to my place and we learned a real valuable lesson about stimulating the wolves and exposing the wolves to the sights and sounds of an exhibit um, and how that influenced their trust, how that influenced their trust with uh, noises, with crowds and how neophobic wolves can really be. And so um, the other legacy that we have is Balazar in the 1989 litter actually was the first wolf that we flew to another exhibit. And he went to Idaho and he starred in an ABC documentary with Jim Dutcher called Wolves Return of a Legend. So that was the first time we ever released one of the wolves of our care into somebody else's care. And then in 1993, we started with uh, Mackenzie, Kiana, Lakota, and Lucas. And they grew up in this exhibit. They were permanent residents, residents of this exhibit. So in 1993, when the Wolves ex Humans exhibit uh, came into play here in Ely, uh, this pack grew up in that facility. So they were used to the exhibit, the sights and the sounds. But another legacy, the first time we had a wolf that just died with no apparent signs, no apparent illness, no preparation, just literally walked up the hill, made a circle like she was going to bed into the grass and dropped to the ground. And that was Kiana. And we lost Kiana in, um, as a six and a half year old. Um, she, um, we don't know. Um, really, we, we did a necropsy, found that she had an enlarged heart. Um, but really, um, it was a metabolic disorder that that she just had a had a had a medical condition and died. So the legacy of Kiana was clearly um, giving us more support for 
uh, doing more thorough medical exams, blood work, testing, looking at everything from how effective our vaccines were, you know, initially we just do a, a, a knockdown and uh, meaning a drugging and we'd have them here at the center and, and, you know, everybody look at their teeth and, oh, they look good. They, you know, we got a weight on them and then we bring them back up. Since Kiana's death, uh, we now are very adamant about uh, getting blood work, uh, again, looking at, at all of the blood panels, uh, getting x-rays, getting, you know, an ultrasound if we have that opportunity and, and doing a much more in-depth uh, uh, type of uh, investigation, as well as um, improving the enclosure and that little clip there that I, that little image that I had reminded us that wolves like high vantage points. And if you only have one rock, somebody's going to miss out. So we really spent a lot of time improving our exhibit, improving dens. Um, and Lucas, um, dying our first wolf to die of cancer. Um, we learned a lot and, and we, we really were just so in, um, uh, grateful uh, in the socialization process. And the one thing that I think was the legacy of the 1993 litter is that we had a team for the first time. In 89, it was kind of a you know, two-person operation where there was just me and a couple of other uh, staff that, that um, helped with the wolves. In 1983, we developed a broad group of people who could be there, who could help, who were trained in immobilizations and the wolves trusted them, including our chair of the board, Nancy Jo Tubbs, uh, there in the blue watching Jen Westland uh, give a, uh, an injection, an immobilization injection to Lucas as we are going to do a, a medical exam. Our founder of the International Wolf Center, Dave Beach, uh, being a part of that uh, wolf care process as well. And then I couldn't talk about legacy without talking about John and Donover um, and their contributions. Uh, we would not have the retired facilities that we have today without their care and concern uh, for our aging wolves. Uh, they love canids as much as we do. And um, they stepped up and, and supported us in uh, the first litter to go into retirement was the 1993 litter. And so many times you'll see clips and video um, Grizzer um, standing at that windows, I call it the uh, the uh, uh, view to the wolf yard. Um, so when Grizzer came into retirement in 2011, having that freedom, that space, and then Luna in 2016 coming into retirement, um, seeing that same view at that same window, and then Aiden and Grizzer sharing that same view together when he came into retirement in 2018. And then obviously now um, Bolts in his short time in retirement in uh, 2020. Um, and we, for the first time actually kind of this week started to see Denali getting a little bit more relaxed. He, he really didn't have the easiest time in retirement but he um, is a coming to the window as well. The other legacy in 2000, in the 1993 litter was that wolves could age and age gracefully. And this is Mackenzie, who uh, lived to be 15, a beautiful, beautiful black wolf as a, as a youngster. And this was the first litter that we chose to cremate and to spread their ashes in some special places around the forest. And that um, brought, again, a, a sense of closure uh, to the wolf care staff. And it was the family uh, of wolf care that I think was really, really the legacy of 1993. The other thing that was kind of a fun legacy was Lakota was the only surviving member of the 1993 litter when we had uh, the uh, wolves. Uh, so she was uh, alive in uh, 2008 when we brought in Aiden and Denali, and she was um, allowed to just kind of roam around the yard. We were here 24 hours a day taking care of pups. We didn't want her alone in the back. So she got to cruise in and out of the lab. She got to steal toys. And it turned out that her favorite thing was taking things from the lab and having us chase her back to retirement to retrieve them. Wallets, blocks of cheese, uh, pup toys, uh, you name it, backpacks. We kind of, uh, she took my mouse pad. We had a joke that she took my wallet, took my mouse pad and was going to start ordering online um, supplies for herself. But uh, that was definitely one of the, the best memories that we have is that summer. Um, then, then Lakota passed away or we actually had euthanized her because she became um, having um, some significant difficulty dealing with the cold weather in November 
So she lived to be 15 and a half and uh, Grizzer has uh, surpassed her uh, by a year. And then we had Shadow and Malik and what the legacy of Shadow and Malik was uh, that male wolves can adopt pups better than probably females. Um, and uh, we also learned that Shadow was a strong, strong pack leader who knew how to pair bond with Maya and really developed what to be pack ownership. And this is Shadow doing what's called a bark howl. You heard that this morning, if you logged in this morning for the sunrise, Grayson's been doing a bark howl as well. And um, that bark howl is ownership of a territory, defense of a territory to the ultimate uh, level of communication. And that's really what I think Shadow's legacy was. Any one of us who are doing working for wolves um, in the years that Shadow was alive have heard that bark howl that says, you're a stranger, get out of my wolf yard. Um, and that's kind of what his what his legacy is. And then we had Nisa in 2004 um, with uh, Maya and Grizzer. And Nisa was not a true pack mate. Uh, she was a pup mate, meaning she was not a true litter mate. Um, she was a pack mate, but she was not a true litter mate. And we lost Nisa at a year of age. And, and certainly her legacy uh, to us was uh, to better understand the implications of pack dynamics on females after a spay. Um, you know, the idea that, you know, you can put a cone on a wolf and you can say, uh, you know, stay there, don't lick your sutures, don't do this, don't rough house, it's just not realistic. And so after Anissa's spay incision opened and, and, and uh, she had, lost part of her intestines to the point where it was not salvageable and we, we euthanized her. We went back into the vet world and said, there's gotta be a better way we can spay these animals without risking um, their health, um, their life and the pack social structure. And that was the big problem with wolves. Separating them causes so much anxiety. And that was the issue that we had with Maya Nisa and their spay. And so the legacy for Nisa was clearly um, just because you're small does not mean that you cannot take on the big boys. And again, um, the bond is so strong. We just um, had to find a better way. And so that better way in now, uh, now spaying ever since Maya and Nisa have been to spay at a, at a younger age. And when we could separate them from the pack and not at risk the social dynamic issues that we had. And then, um, Maya also created a legacy during the, from that litter. She was born in 2004, Grizzer's sister. He created a legacy that said, you know what? You don't have to be a male to raise leg urinate. You don't have to be a male to control the entire pack. You don't have to be a male to be the leader of a pack. And so even though she was uh, pair bonded with Shadow, Maya did most of the heavy lifting when it came to dominance. And um, that was... Um, probably fine with Shadow. He was a pretty passive wolf, but may not be so fine with Aiden because she was pretty hard on Aiden. And certainly if we uh, knew then what we know now, we wondered if Maya didn't see Aiden's potential as a pup to be a leader because she certainly focused all of her efforts on making Aiden um, subordinate to her. Um, but uh, in the end, a pair bonding with her after we retired Shadow. So we saw Aiden as kind of a weepy eyed, stressed, um, taking things a lot more personal pup. But we also saw what Maya saw in that Aiden's capacity for social bonding was tremendous. He bonded much better th than with the adult wolves than Denali did. And um, this is Grizzer standing here with Aiden and you can see this rub on her chin, this very paying homage to the adults. That was Aiden's legacy and that's who Aiden was. And that came into play when Aiden retired. He took up with Grizzer the same place they left off, nose to nose, pals. And um, that was the first Aiden time personal space, that, we had, uh, Aiden, that we had two adult wolves rejoin each other um, uh, that had been previously um, uh, pack mates. Now that wasn't the first time we put two adult wolves together. Luna from the 2012 litter 
um, had a circumstance where she had some medical issues and, and um, she had a lot of separation when she was younger for some surgeries. And we don't know if it was um, something in her history, something in her medical condition, but she was definitely food possessive. And um, this is Luna and Bolts in 2012. And Luna had no problem keeping food from anybody, um, including her pup mate, um, not letting uh, Bolts have her deer hide. Um, she, again, smaller, the legacy of Nisa and Luna was, you don't have to be big to be able to control food resources. And this is Luna letting Denali, who's one and a half times her size, know that he cannot have this bone, even though it's not really worth anything, there's no meat on it. Uh, but for Luna's sake, that old piece of bone was hers and there's no 140 pound wolf that's gonna take it from her. So Luna's legacy, we, uh, if you know about her history was she had some severe medical issues, some significant intervention to try to solve her back leg problem. And we also know from Luna that you can't guarantee that a pup introduction is gonna work. We thought, we and we'd gone along with pup introductions in the year 2000, the year 2004, the year 2008, We'd had successful pup introductions. 2012 worked out well. Um, even with Luna having a bad leg and we were very worried about her, you know, being uh, vulnerable and weak. And we thought, you know what, we've done this. We've done this four or five times. It's working, but it didn't work for Luna. Um, Luna, for whatever reason, saw those pups as a threat, saw um, them as a, something to be a little bit more predatory, certainly a little bit more focused. Uh, we don't know what was going on in Luna's brain, but it was not safe for the pups. And so Luna came into retirement the day we brought Axel and Grayson in, Luna came into retirement. So the legacy for us in Luna's life was um, understanding what pain a wolf may have and how that pain might prompt them to be a little bit different in how they behave. Like I said, Luna was introduced to Grizzer. That was the first time we ever took a, two adult wolves who'd never met each other and put them together. Uh, Aiden and Grizzer had met each other. And so, so we knew that that would work, but we didn't know that Luna would, especially since Luna got a little food possessive. And so her history of her medical conditions, and here she is, Grizzer's just walking by in an adjacent pen and she's doing a threat display. So the other thing that I think um, is important to recognize is that um, from Luna's legacy, Luna um, was the first wolf and, and again, with support from members and donors and people who believe in um, doing the best animal care possible, um, supported us in hiring a consultant to help understand Luna's circumstance, to understand Luna's pain, um, taught us some valuable lessons on how to manage her how to treat her and actually Luna uh, presenting um, her back leg to staff, um, letting them know that um, you know she was okay with the body work. It helped her, it made her feel comfortable in her last years of her life. And um, next Thursday, it will be a year since uh, we euthanized Luna. And so that's what's the challenge is, every one of these wolves take a piece of your heart. Every one of these wolves, take every ounce of, of care that we can give them. And um, obviously Luna and Bolts are, are two wolves that, that took a lot of our heart and our care. And um, losing those two less than a year apart um, was, is still a very, very, very hard thing for the wolf care staff. Um, Bolts uh, was a unique character. Um, there's just no words to express how important it is to understand that the personality traits of these wolves um, is, is something that we, as a benefit of the socialization process, we get to see them, we get to meet them, we get to share every moment with them, we get to understand them, we get to truly understand that these are social carnivores. Everybody knows that wolves, you know, kill things. Everybody knows that wolves, uh, you know, um, um, you know, kill their prey and they hunt and, and everybody knows the predator, but the benefit of the International Wolf Center's Ambassador Wolf Program is that we let you know the social being 
that has vulnerabilities. And that's the one thing about Bolts is he had phobias, he had issues, and the wolf care staff will go above and beyond um, to try to help an animal deal with not only the physical, but the psychological, even to the point of buying a little bubble machine that shot out uh, bacon flavored bubbles over his head so we could try to desensitize him to the phobia of things flying around his head. And he liked them, he liked bacon flavored bubbles. Um, and uh, again, oh, we're grateful to the many people who suggested things to try to help him through not only the physical, but also the psychological challenges that he faced in the last months of his life. And uh, just kind of as a side note, um, you know, we did get a little bit of a neurological information in. Um, it confirmed what we knew in the MRI. It confirmed what we knew in the spinal tap. There was nothing in his brain that would cause a lesion that would cause a neurological disorder. There was nothing in his spine. Uh, we're still waiting for more tests uh, yesterday. Uh, the pathologist asked me to, uh, or through our vet, had asked us to uh, provide a timeline, a video to be able to show, uh, you know, what was his stage as a progression of this disease as they try to help us uh, come up with a diagnosis. And so in the Give to the Wolves uh, link, you'll see one of those links is the, uh, uh, one of the donation buttons was the price of these surveillance cameras, what it takes to broadcast, what it takes to uh, for us to maintain a surveillance system. And, and again, I can just say that it is critical to the care that the wolves get, that we have that ability to look back at footage, to be able to see um, how animals are functioning, you know, how they're behaving, what are they stressing about, and, and um, have that information readily available. So with that, I wanted to say thanks uh, to everyone uh, for supporting us and give to the max for the successful day. Um, again, we are still accepting donations till midnight. So if you know anybody who's uh, been working all day and uh, missed out and uh, wants to join us, check out our website at wolf.org and uh, hopefully uh, try to share that information. So I'm not gonna take any questions tonight. I will have a webinar in December. If you wanna have uh, more questions, um, I'm certainly be happy to take them. Um, at that time, but uh, tonight I just wanted to share the legacy and um, the legacy that is our Ambassador Wolves. So thank you uh, for, for joining us and thanks for your support.